I think I thought that we were having an argument and that as soon as we had a preponderance of evidence clearly piled on one side, our leaders would do the right thing. It took me a while to figure out that we'd won the argument long before the science was abundantly clear. We were just losing the fight because the fight wasn't about data and reason. The fight was about what fights are usually about, money and power. And we were losing to the fossil fuel industry, which had plenty of both. So we knew we weren't going to have much money, but we decided to see if we couldn't build uh, a movement. And because history indicates that occasionally uh, big movements are able to stand up to big power. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project, a grassroots farmer-led movement with an ad on organic food label that distinguishes soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock under the USDA Organic Seal. You just heard environmentalist and author Bill McKibben talking about how he built a movement around the climate action group 350.org. There are many similarities to the movement behind 350.org and the farmer-led Real Organic Project. You can help us build our movement by visiting our website, realorganicproject.org, and becoming one of our thousand real fans. Now let's get back to my co-director Dave Chapman's interview with Bill McKibben. So welcome to the Real Organic Podcast, and I'm talking today with Bill McKibben. Um, Bill is very well known as the author of many books, Earth, Sand of Nature, Falter, Oil and Honey, and also as the co-founder of uh, 350.org. Welcome, Bill. Well, what a pleasure to be with you, David. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Um, so before we dive into some of your life's work, I, I would like to just touch a little bit about your life, about how you got to this work. Um, I know you were born in California and you moved to Massachusetts. I read that your father actually was arrested at a protest for the Vietnam War. Yeah, my father was a journalist and a business journalist and not one to be involved in things like that. But at a certain point the, in the Vietnam War, um, the Vietnam veterans against the war led by a then young John Kerry uh, came to Lexington, Massachusetts, where we lived and wanted to camp out on the battle green and Four or five hundred townspeople went to stay with them and protect them from the police, and they were all arrested before the night was over. And your father was one of those townspeople. Indeed, he was. And I was uh, ten or eleven at the time, and I can remember it well. Yeah, was that um, you know it was such a such a divided time in the country? Was that uh, a very radical thing for him to do? Um. Yeah, in a way, I guess. But, you know, it didn't change his, I mean, he kept being a business journalist and, and no one thought twice about it. I mean, it was a radically divided time in certain ways. But I think, I think by that point, at least in Massachusetts, sentiment had turned so strongly against the war that, that, it, that people were very grateful to those who were standing up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just wanted to get a sense of, of your roots. You you went to Harvard? I did. I, I followed my father's footsteps as a journalist and started working for the local paper when I was 13 or 14, and then went to Harvard where I mostly just worked on the newspaper there, the Harvard Crimson. And after that, you went almost immediately to the New Yorker. Yeah, about a week after I graduated, I <laughs> started work at the, as a staff writer at the New Yorker in, in New York City and spent five years there before I retreated to the countryside where I've been ever since. Yeah. Well, that's an amazing jump from, from being a college student to being a staff writer for the New Yorker. Yes, um, it was a bit of a fluke, but it was great fun and easier in those days because... The talk of the town, which I was mostly writing, was all anonymous in those days. So people didn't know that it was a stripling 21-year-old that was doing a lot of the work. And when you left that, 
You went to Vermont immediately? No, I moved to the Adirondacks. I've spent much of my life, pretty much all my adult life, on either side of Lake Champlain. But the first long stretch of it was really quite deep in the woods in the central Adirondacks. We moved to Vermont about 20 years ago, and we live in a town of about 500, which is a major metropolis compared with where we were living before. All right. I know Ripton, actually. Yes. I have friends there, too. It's a nice um, town. Very nice you, town. Well, when did, when did you become engaged in environmentalism? When did you become an activist? How did that become a strong thing for you? Well, I wrote The End of Nature in 1989. So I was 20, I guess I was 27 when I wrote it and 28 when it came out. Um, and it was the first book about climate change for a general audience. And it did quite well. I think it's in 24 languages or something. And so from that point on, I, I mean, I've been very enmeshed in this issue. Um, um, but it took 10 or 15 years before that switched from mostly writing about it to mostly trying to act on it. And really the slowness of that was my own slowness at figuring out that I think I'd thought that we were having an argument and that as soon as we had a preponderance of evidence clearly piled on one side, our leaders would do the right thing. It took me a while to figure out that we'd won the argument long before the science was abundantly clear. We were just losing the fight because the fight wasn't about data and reason. The fight was about what fights are usually about, money and power. And we were losing to the fossil fuel industry, which had plenty of both. So we knew we weren't going to have much money, but we decided to see if we couldn't build uh, a movement. And because history indicates that occasionally uh, big movements are able to stand up to big power. And 350.org, which I helped form uh, more than a decade ago, was kind of the first iteration of a global grassroots climate movement. And now happily, there are many, many other iterations, you know, Sunrise Movement and the Green New Deal and Extinction Rebellion and Fridays for the Future with school kids from around the planet and on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's an interesting idea that, you know, one of the things that I hear a lot is, why don't we all get together and have one movement and I actually really like uh, Paul Hawkins' idea that it is one movement, but, you know, he put it out forward in Blessed Unrest that uh, we need the kind of social diversity as we would want uh, there to be biological diversity in the soil for real health. Well, that's true. An important part of movement building for us has been trying to figure out how to get all different organizations to collaborate effectively. And that's very useful. Yeah, yeah. We've seen great examples in the fights over the Keystone Pipeline or the Dakota Access Pipeline or fossil fuel divestment or lots and lots and lots and lots of collaboration from the big, you know, old line green environmental groups like the Sierra Club to uh, environmental justice groups. So much of the leadership coming from indigenous communities, frontline communities. It's really been that part's really been fun. So when you say that you moved from participating in a, what you saw as a public debate to moving more towards direct action, if I've got that right, towards political action, um, when it was still on the level of a public debate when you were writing The End of Nature, what kind of change did that make in your life personally? I mean, you, you, well, you're a very good writer and you were writing a lot. And I tell you, writing was moving a lot of people. It was building a movement. But you see it as something quite different. Well, I don't see What's it as something difference? quite... I mean, they're, they're quite related. And I, I continue to do a lot of writing. Um, and that's really how I think of myself. I'm not a trained organizer. And I'm not, you know, whatever. We just made it up as we went along. Um, but, I mean, just in day-to-day -day terms, it meant that I was constantly on the road. Because at 350.org, we were organizing around the planet. I mean... We've organized demonstrations in every country except North Korea. Um, so I spent a number of years 
you know, away more than I was home and in absolutely constant motion. And happily, I was smart enough while I was doing it to be training up the crew of uh, young people who now run the whole thing, you know. Um, so that, at least I was wise enough to do that because the pace of doing that for five or six years, uh, if I'd done it too much longer, I, you know, would have done me in. Yeah, yeah. So can we go to the the beginning of 350.org and and what that looked like? How how did that how did that happen? We formed 350. You know, we did a. Uh, as I say, we didn't know what we were doing, but I had organized a little march down the western edge of Vermont in the summer of 2006. We spent four or five days walking from Ripton to Burlington. By the time we got there, we had a thousand people, which is good number for Vermont. But the scary thing was the papers the next day said it was probably the largest demonstration about climate change that had yet taken place in the U.S. And that really underscored just how much, you know, how much room there was for organizing. We had we had all the things you'd need for a movement, you know, policy people and scientists and Al Gore. The only part of the movement we lacked was the movement part. So we set to work building it. We, in this case, being me and seven then undergraduates at Middlebury College, where I was teaching. These were remarkable young people um, who have all continued to do great work in this field. And, and you know, we just started organizing and, and reaching out around the world. Our first big day of climate action, really the first planet scale day of action around climate change was in the fall of 2009. And I think we had 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries. So CNN said it was the most widespread day of political action in the planet's history. And from there, we kept doing that kind of organizing. And we also started the kind of more militant and um, uh, organizing around fossil fuel infrastructure, beginning with the Keystone Pipeline, and around uh, fossil fuel financing, beginning with this divestment campaign that's become the biggest anti-corporate campaign in history. We're at about $14 trillion now in endowments and portfolios that have divested in part or in whole from fossil fuel. So, that's a, a, a remarkable list of achievements. I know there's so much to go, but it is amazing to go from a march of a thousand people in Vermont to uh, a rally in 181 countries. Was that with seven students essentially organizing it? Yeah, well, I mean, part of what it, I mean, of course, you can't really organize 5,200 different events. and and. So it was much, much closer to like a potluck supper, you know, we'd set the date and the theme and then just reached out to people to bring what they could. And it turned out there was a great deal of kind of latent demand. Um, there was an ecological niche to be filled. There were people all over the world very worried about climate change, but not feeling like they had some way to make that worry felt. And so it was really important at the, those early stages to kind of demonstrate that there were other people who were in feeling the same way and to start work down this path. Yeah. I, I you know, as we, as we formed the Real Organic Project, uh, I felt like we were stepping into a vast field of depression where uh, so many people had worked for years for something that they believed in and they felt they'd lost it um, to the corporations and, and to the government through the influence of the corporations. And uh, they were depressed and they were hopeless. It was interesting. And all they needed was like a few people to say, you know, let's get together and, and we can do this ourselves. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Uh, one of the things that I, I've also been impressed with the fact that <clears throat> more often than I would expect, when you fight, you win. Um, even up against very, very big, powerful corporations and things. Uh, we've been able to start winning a series of victories, not enough to turn around climate change yet, but definitely enough to weaken the power of the fossil fuel industry and their ability to dictate the political uh, terms of things. I think that um, if Donald Trump 
knock on wood, pray God gets voted out of office, it, it, it'll become abundantly clear to everyone uh, how much ground the fossil fuel industry has lost because he's pretty much what they've got going for him at this point. Right, right. Um, there's a famous line from um, Michael Pollan. I think it was actually, he might have been quoting Obama saying, you know, until we can light up the switchboards, we don't have a food movement. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that what you've been doing is make it that you can light up the switchboards. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And of course, Michael is a great thinker about these kind of things. And he's been a great help at, at many turns. And I'm so glad that he's done such a good job of thinking about how these things relate uh, across other areas, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that um, actually, I think I'm, we'll talk about some of the very strong connections between what we're doing and what you've been doing for the last 14 years, because I think they're there. But in, in even regardless of the immediate connections, I'm fascinated by building a movement requires getting people to find each other. There, there needs to be connections. Uh, you've taken a tremendous uh, number of people all over the world who have a common, a common goal, common desire, but you've woven those people together so that the fabric is stronger. That's been the hope. Um, um, you know, we did, ex we were kind of lucky. We, 350.org started in the um, halcyon early days of the uh, of kind of social media. Uh, Facebook barely existed and it hadn't turned into a horror show. Uh, Twitter didn't exist yet, but we had things like Flickr that allowed us to communicate pretty easily. And so people called it the first kind of open source campaigning. And people were still very interested. You know, it hadn't yet the internet hadn't yet come quite the oppressive force it's become now. Um, so we had a sweet spot in there when it was quite possible to quickly get people engaged. And how do you think that's changed on the internet? Because I'm, I'm kind of wrestling with that. It, it, it seems like something that had such a promise of being a democratizing force is actually being used as a weapon against democracy. Yeah, no, it's a sewer of misinformation and craziness and and nastiness and and all that there's no choice but to make use of it some but it's um uh, uh well i'm glad we're not trying to start 350.org now you think it would be much harder i now? do i do i think yeah. there's a lot more noise in the system is that because just that there is so much noise or because the system itself has gotten more sophisticated at filtering out certain voices? Probably some of each. I mean, great voices can still break through. I mean, witness Greta Thunberg, um, yeah. you know, um, and all the other 10,000 Greta Thunbergs scattered around the world who've done an amazing job these last years. Uh, but, but it's harder and the pushback comes more immediately. And, you know, it's... Um, I mean, those kids are enduring things online that nobody should have to endure, especially not young people. So uh, there is this uh, dynamic tension between the local and the enormous world movement. And um, it's something that we all deal with. And it's so tempting to say, I'm just going to think locally or I'm just going to act locally. And... I see that the, when we look at the real challenges, the existential challenges that we face, climate change and you know nuclear war, these are things that can only be dealt with on an international level. Well, that's one of the interesting things. I mean, climate change obviously has to, you know, it would help to deal with it at an international level. They don't call it global warming for nothing. But it also has to be dealt with on the local level. I mean, the UN isn't going to put new insulation in your attic for you. You know, they're not going to make sure you have a heat pump instead of a oil burner. Um, you know, they're not going to come put solar panels on the roof of your garage, whatever it is. 
Um, so it has to be dealt with at, at every level. Um, that's, that's one of the reasons that it's difficult. Um, we have to move very, very quickly, and our systems at most levels aren't set up to move quickly. Local level actually in a certain way can move a little faster and more nimbly than some of the others sometimes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it is possible, you know, to change the, to have a march in Vermont and get a thousand people to come. It's, that's not a huge sell. No, but it's, I mean, but I, I confess it's been sobering to see how difficult it's been to get, say, Vermont, which you think would be pretty easy to change. Vermont's, uh, just to give you an example, Vermont's pension fund continues to be invested in fossil fuel companies. They've refused to divest even after thousands of universities and churches and huge endowments and insurance companies and everybody else have divested. So, um, you know, even in the places that should be easiest, you get um, obstruction and delay and, you know, inertia itself is just an extraordinarily powerful force. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes when I look at places like uh, Denmark, which is, uh, Paul Hawkins says, oh, you can't use Denmark. <laughs> but I look at, at what they're able to do in government there. And just in the world of organic you know, they've made a huge commitment to take the country as far and as close to being all organic as they can. And I thought, well, that's a pretty big ask for the U.S., but maybe we could do it in Vermont. And But, yeah. but you're right. Even there, it's not easy. Yeah. Uh, the Scandinavian countries may actually be in a kind of sweet spot. They're, they've got strong national governments, but they're small enough that everybody feels a part of things. There's high levels of social trust. Uh, which is very useful. Um, we're finding out in the pandemic what a disaster it is to have low levels of social trust. Um, and, and, you know, they're wealthy and, you know, all the other things that make life a little easier. Um, the, but they really are a, a good model for what we could be doing on a thousand different topics in, in this world. So most of, most of your work um, has been about challenging uh, the fossil fuel industry and about uh, dramatically, trying to dramatically reduce our use of fossil fuels in order to release, to stop the release of carbon into the atmosphere, to stop the increasing of the greenhouse effect. I am curious because there is uh, a lot of information out there now relating to agriculture and its impact on um, climate change. And you yourself have put out some good information on the impact of climate change on agriculture, mm. um, you know, which was interesting. And in Falter, you know, you really addressed that agriculture is going to change pretty dramatically and pretty rapidly as a result of climate change. Yep. And um, it's a tough could you time. Talk a little bit about that. Sure, it's a tough time to be. A, you know, farming is, you know, hard work in the best of times, and it requires a lot of judgment. And you know, but now that that work is getting all but impossible in a lot of places because it's no longer possible to count on uh, traditional patterns of rainfall, of seasonality, of temperature variation. Um, or, or of pest uh, um, dispersal. Um, all those things are changed in the most dramatic ways by climate change. And so, you know, you watch year in, year out, you know, one year it's so hot in the Midwest that corn can't really fertilize because it's, you know, above 95 in the crucial week. And the next year it's so wet that people can't get their tractors in the field and, you know, Right now, the Central Valley of California, which is, you know, by far the most agriculturally important, you know, few square miles in America, you can't harvest anything because you can't go outside because the wildfire smoke is so dangerous. Um, although I did see horrifying pictures of uh, migrant laborers picking cucumbers using the um, flashlights on their cell phones to find them amidst the gloom of the 
wildfires. Um, so it's a very hard time. Uh, the good news is, perhaps, that there may be ways for agriculture to play a real role in helping here, too. Now, I don't want to overstate it. I mean, the first thing is we think agriculture is responsible for about 18% or so of greenhouse gas emissions, most of that from livestock, um, you know, from cattle. Um, um, but 18% is not going to save the world, but it's not, you know, nothing either. That's a big, it would be a big help. The, I think the way to think about it is much of the work we're doing at the moment around, you know, uh, renewable energy and, and cracking down on the fossil fuel industry has to do with how much carbon we're, we're pouring. Um, if you think of this system as like a bathtub, you know, we're trying to shut down the spigot uh, so that there's not more carbon pouring into the system. But we've already got too much in the system. I mean, we're at, we need to be at 350 parts per million CO2 or less, and we're at about 415 parts per million. So we're already way past where we should be. And that means we also need to, uh, we need to somehow widen the drain at the bottom of the bathtub too and figure out ways to soak up more carbon. And one way to do that would be to have healthy, healthier soils that are more likely to take up more uh, carbon and methane from the atmosphere. So that's why people are getting excited about uh, regenerative agriculture and so on and so forth. I, I think those things are very exciting. I got to go out to see my old friend Wes Jackson at the Land Institute last autumn and give the big talk at the uh, annual Prairie Festival, and that's what I devoted it to. And they were having a seminar with uh, a lot of scientists there talking about it. The one caution I would add, however, is that this is not going to be an easy or quick fix. I mean, it's really hard to take on the oil companies. The, they're incredibly rich and powerful, but the advantage is they're a manageable target set. There's 15 of them, you know. There's a billion farmers on the planet. Um, uh, they have, in many cases, long set cultural and agricultural practices. Uh, I've spent my life in rural America, so I know a lot of farmers are just stubborn anyway, um, you know, um, and don't like, for good reasons, don't like being told what to do by anybody. <laughs> so, yeah. so I, it's not like, you know, five years from now, we're going to have, you know, everybody and every farmer in the world. Do, and, I, but I do think that the, the ground for change is, is there. And I have a feeling that, you know, that the next one of the places we really need to be working. I mean, at this point, individual change doesn't get us that far. We need big structural change. And the avenue for that most likely is the farm bill, um, you know, and the next one can't just be what it usually is, which is just another uh, rubber stamp subsidy giveaway to big commodity farming. I mean, it, we actually have to grapple with the fact that, you know, the soil of the United States is an important strategic asset that we've got to, for many reasons, pay attention to. Yeah. All right. Well, there's a lot there. I want to unpack a few things. One is, uh, I'm just curious because uh, I've seen different numbers for the contribution of, it's an awful positive word, but the contribution of agriculture to climate change. And uh, I think 14% was the lowest I've seen and 51% is the highest. Yeah, I, I, think people have, Institute. I think people have taken apart the 51% number okay. pretty powerfully. Uh, the FAO says 18% is 18. What, okay. what I've seen. Um, but I mean, you know, at any rate, it's large. It's large. And, and it, partly and it depends a lot of on how you're counting comes from deforestation in the tropics is a big part yeah. of that. Um, and how you're counting that and what you're allocating it to uh, right. is a big part. So that's, you know, and at the moment that's going terribly. 
uh, Brazil has a Trump-like um, president who's, you know, we're, we're back to, uh, I mean, Brazil had made real and powerful progress in protecting the Amazon. It was one of the few real success stories on the planet. And that success has been turned upside down by Bolsonaro, which is a huge problem. Yeah, yeah. So um, there are different aspects of agriculture that are impactful. And perhaps the biggest one is the, the industrial confinement livestock operations. And as you say, the, the clear cutting is mostly to grow food for those confinement operations. Um, the methane from the cattle is much, much greater impact if those cattle are in confinement rather than, than on pasture where... Right, and there's at least some reason to think that done wisely, having animals on pasture is a uh, technology for improving soil instead of degrading it. As you know, there's been a lot of interesting work done around uh, rotational grazing um, and so on. I mean, again, we're still kind of early days with this and the results, as you would expect, differ enormously from whether you're in a, you know, a moist tropical environment or an arid steppe or, a, you know, wherever you are. I mean, we graze cattle almost every place that we can on the planet. Um, and, and the results of, you know, things like rotational grazing are very dependent on, on those factors. But there's, there's uh, definitely provocative hints that there's good possibilities there. So the thing that is, for me, uh, both a tremendous opportunity and also um, somewhat of a tragic problem is that Real organic farming is the kind of farming we're talking about where the animals are on pasture. And and it's marvelous to see that that millions of people are turning to buy organic food now in the stores. That is only a wonderful event. That is success, that they're turning away from chemical agriculture. The tragedy for me is that a lot of certified organic food now is coming from confinement dairies from <laughs> confinement poultry. That's why the, you know, one of the big reasons that the Real Organic Project exists. Yeah. Because we don't want to lose this opportunity to Absolutely. give people a way of supporting the agriculture they want to support. Absolutely. That's why, I mean, these guys started figuring this out, you know, but, but, the, but clearly the spirit of the enterprise is, is different from where it began. And of course, it's why so many people are now at least as equally interested in local food and, and should be. Um, this is something that's interested me for a long time. You know, I think I taught the first course on local food production at a, a American college in 2000 at Middlebury. And I know it was early on because we had nothing to read. I mean, Michael Pollan hadn't written anything yet about any of this. And, uh, all we had to read and fall back on, of course, was was Wendell Berry, um, you know, who's my old and dear friend who's been at this as long as his entire life, you know. Um, it's been beautiful to watch that movement blossom. Um, and And one of the few cheerful things one can say about 2020 is that it feels like a lot more people sort of joined in as the pandemic took hold, you know. Um, if I'm, I, if I, I think we can trust our friends at places like High Mowing Seeds who report extraordinary demand for, <laughs> for their product. Uh, I, I, you know, I've read you can't even hardly buy a chick at the moment to start your uh, flock with. And so that, that's why we're working so hard to try and make sure that if you don't know your farmer, can you trust what you're getting? Because, of course, you know, for somebody in Vermont, it's relatively easy to know your farmer at least some of the year. But uh, if you're like my son and you live in New York City, then it's a, it's a tougher, tougher game. Let me 
ask a question about one other aspect of agriculture and climate that I was new to me. I don't know if you know Walter Yenna or not, but um, he's an Australian, so a microbiologist, and he's come to Vermont and given some workshops over on our side of the state. And uh, of course, he talks about drawdown and carbon sequestration, but he's also talking about the need to cool the planet and reverse desertification. Mm -hmm. And that the same things accomplish both, that the very things that you would do to, uh, he would talk about the, the soil carbon sponge, to increase the soil carbon sponge are the things that increase the water holding capacity of the land and increase the ability to keep the land green longer. So what are his techniques? What is he using to accomplish this? It's, I think he's talking about very, um, what we would now call standard uh, organic regenerative agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, reduced tillage. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not heard him insist on no-till, but reduced tillage, you know, minimize it, um, keep it green as long in the year as you can. Mm -hmm. And of course, his experience in Australia is much more with um, what I think Alan Savory would call brittle yeah, arid, climate. You know, arid you know, system. Very arid systems. And uh, uh, use animals skillfully. So, uh, you know, There's keep, a... them, keep them, that the, the pastures rotating and then recovering before you return the animals. Depending where you are, there's, I mean, all kinds of different interesting iterations of this, especially in tropical areas. This sort of move to agroforestry has been really, really interesting. And people figuring out how to use shade as a, you know, kind of tool and uh, figuring out how to have a real diversity of crops, you know. I mean, one of the real problems with one of the many real problems with the agricultural model we've adopted is everybody just grows one thing, you know. And A, it must be boring as hell for farmers to just year after year produce soybeans, you know, and by the hundreds of acres. But, but B, you know, I mean, if you can figure out how to make it work economically, it's obviously way more sensible to use a piece of land to produce a lot of different things at different times of the year and at different heights and you know so on so that kind of permaculture notion is is spreading nicely too i think yeah and one of the things that uh is striking to me that this this kind of agriculture that we're talking about and i call it real organic a lot of people call it regenerative is uh the thing that you need to add by and large is information is knowledge. It's not actually that we need new technology in terms of new machinery or something like that. We mostly just need to be very skillful. Yes, you also need a fair amount of, of elbow grease too. <laughs> of course, that's true. That's true even for the most industrial farm yeah. is, that, is that it is a lot of hard work. Yeah. But one of the things that I believe, and I, I think that for most small farmers, the biggest challenge that they face isn't how to grow their crop, it's how to sell it. I think that's market. right. I think that's right. And I think your emphasis on information is really powerful. I mean, there was a day when the extension services really were a huge help here. But in too many cases, they got kind of captured by, you know, uh, industrial agriculture. There's been a great move around much of the world, again, I think especially in the tropics and in rice growing areas and things, to farmer schools where farmers are really good about teaching, you know, the sort of the equivalent of what we, you know, what farmers would call field days here or something when you really, uh, and, and, and these have gotten to a large scale and people are really learning how to do, you know, uh, low input rice cultivation and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. So helps to have it, a, it helps to have a density, a greater density of farmers on the ground than we do. You know, it's one of the problems with having so few farmers is that there are fewer people to lean on for information, ideas, whatever. 
Yeah, I know that uh, in the Midwest, they're getting fewer and fewer farmers, bigger and bigger farms. Actually, in the Northeast, we're getting more and more farms. Absolutely. Smaller, Lots of small farms. farms. So that's, and it's, it's fun to watch that. I mean, you're seeing it over there in the, you know, and, and, in in the Connecticut River Valley, and we you can definitely see it in the Champlain uh, Valley, you know, and and I've been impressed in Vermont with what a terrific battery the Intervale turned out to be for mm. producing. You know, I mean that was the perfect example of a place where people could come together, learn a craft from each other. You know, everybody there, and 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 now just kind of spinning off across the region uh, to do their farming. Actually, by creating a, a hub, literally, they call it a hub, um, you know, they're able to create uh, some marketing momentum. Yep. Um, so, I, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm wondering about here is your thoughts about, um, you've been very involved in connecting people to, uh, to limit and, and, and stop the, the fossil fuel industry from expanding and to find alternative ways of providing the energy that people need in the world. Um, do you think that that kind of social movement is important in terms of people supporting the kind of agriculture that will also enhance their lives? Absolutely. And as I say, the, we're at a point now where because climate change is moving so fast and needs to be arrested so quickly that I think probably the most important part of that work, I mean, yes, there's a lot of marketing and, you know, all of that to worry about, but we also need just powerful political presence around agriculture, just as around energy. Um, because right now, everybody has to swim upstream uh, all the time. You're always fighting the force of gravity. I mean, gravity in this case, meaning a subsidy program that literally subsidizes two things, you know, uh, corn and soybeans, and leaves everything else to fend for itself, you know. Um, um, so changing that to give some more room, uh, some more, uh, some more space for uh, other things to flourish, that's really a political task uh, 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 above all. Okay, and your thoughts about how to approach that political task? Well, I mean, one of the problems is that the thing, the places that you'd sort of normally turn to have sort of been co-opted. The Farm Bureau really too often exists as a kind of mouthpiece for industrial agriculture. I've been very happy to see the Grange movement uh, reappearing in some places anyway. Um, and I, I, you know, it's possible it could be a political force, but we need we need eaters to be as prominent in this fight as farmers. You know, because um, uh, it turns out there's a lot more eaters than there are farmers, um, and 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 those people demanding political change the next time the farm bill comes up is really important. It, you know. It's, so it's incumbent upon movements to come up with two or three clear, uh, spreadable, understandable demands out of the next farm bill, and then for the rest of us to try and figure out how to put pressure on as best we can. Yeah. Um, at, at one of our first rallies here in Thetford, Shelley Pingree came over from Maine, and uh, you know she's a great champion there. Yes, yes. And, and Pat Leahy spoke, yep. and Peter Wells spoke. It was, it was a really fun party, actually. Yep. And Shelley, Shelley was really good, and she said, you know, there's $320 million a year being spent in Washington on food lobbyists who are trying to shape the opinions of, of our government. She said that's more money than spent in a year by the defense industry. So... You know, and they really want to change what is, gets sold as organic. So you have your work cut out for you. We have our work cut out for us. And I thought, yeah, it's really hard when we're up against these forces because in the end, as you say, the, the farms are getting bigger. There's fewer and fewer. So the money is getting consolidated. 
The supermarkets, the same thing is happening. The processors, the same thing is happening. And so when, when a lot of money is in a few hands, they're very good at using that money to influence the process to support what they would like to see. Absolutely. And, and you know, um, all things being equal, they will always win because, you know, they're there 24-7. I mean, they have one job. It's to uh, secure favors for their industry. If one lobbyist burns out, you just plug another one in, you know. Um, and they're aware that activists and things tend to be sporadic in their attentions and uh, uh, fierce one moment and, and tired the next and so on. So we do have to figure out ways to keep that pressure ongoing all the time. And it's why it's really important that we have, you know, uh, uh, lobbyists from places like the Sierra Club or wherever it is that are uh, uh, they're working, they're under, they're outmanned and outspent, but we can make up for that by having enough people behind them that politicians are a little worried about um, offending them. Yeah. I asked uh, a friend of mine in Denmark, how, how are you so successful in, in getting the organic movement to be embraced by the government? And he said, we partnered with the environmental movement and uh, very strongly. Yeah. And they perceived that we were their allies. And we knew that they were our allies. And together, we were able to be much more effective with the government. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, there is an attitude uh, that is that government is bad. There's. Uh, it's almost actually, a, I would say, a, a, an ideology or an article of faith and and it may be our current government that that um... well this was I mean this I mean it was Ronald Reagan really in our lifetimes who introduced this idea that the government was the problem not the solution you know Reagan's favorite laugh line in speeches for years was the nine scariest words in the English language are I'm from the government and I'm here to help you know ha 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 but it turns out that's nonsense. I mean, the scariest words in the English language are we've run out of ventilators or the hillside behind your house is caught on fire, you know, and you can't solve those with market forces. You solve them with social solidarity, with governments that people have built to do the work that we need governments to do. And that's really, I, mean, I, I hope that that might be one lesson people are taking from this pandemic year. Yeah, that's great. Do you see do you see those California fires as a manifestation of climate change? Oh, they're I mean, it's precisely what scientists have told us is going to happen for a long time and they've been steadily increasing. I mean, we had the highest temperature ever reliably recorded on earth this um this summer in California. It was 130 degrees Fahrenheit at Death Valley. That's really scary, but Death Valley's supposed to be awfully hot. Two weeks ago, I don't know if you've ever been to San Luis Obispo in California, but it's just a few miles from the Pacific Ocean. And the temperature there got to 120 degrees. I mean, this is a place where people are trying to farm and, you know, so yeah. on and so forth. I mean, 120 degrees, that's, you know. And so when it gets super hot like that, Dave, the first thing that happens is the soil moisture just dries out like that. I mean, it happens so fast. The curves are incredible. And once those soil moisture is all gone, I mean, fires just explode. I mean, you know, we've always had forest fires. We just have never had explosive forest fires like this that go off like bombs and two days later have covered 400,000 acres. And not only is it so destructive of of the human civilization in the area, but um, it also is tremendous carbon release. Yes, yeah. well, yeah, exactly right. The, the feedback loops are intense and growing. Uh, truly, the scariest fires this year probably aren't even the ones in California or Australia, terrifying as those are. Uh, massive fires up in Siberia for the third year in a row. And there was this report last week that these fires have now begun to burn into the peatlands of the far north. And those peat, uh, peat 
peatlands are the storehouse of huge quantities of carbon. Um, um, the idea of that going up in smoke is really terrifying. Yeah. It was really interesting when I was reading Falter, you were talking about higher CO2 levels and its impact on the nutrition of food. Yep. Could you talk about that? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's been a couple of big, massive studies in the last couple of years uh, indicating that uh, that food, in essence, is becoming uh, uh, less nutritious over time. There are less nutrients. and one reason has to do with growth patterns under you know elevated conditions of co2 and higher temperature we've always known that co2 uh, all things being equal uh, increases plant growth but it's not going to do it in a way that's useful for us you know because uh, it's rarely the limiting factor you know in a, but it, it means that as things grow they grow differently and are less nutritious and the numbers are pretty startling, I got to say. People have gone back and looked at things they have samples of over the last hundred years, like goldenrod, and the protein content just goes down and down and down and down and down. That's so interesting because, of course, I, I've been tracking that and Don Davis's work um, on nutrition, and we were attributing that entirely to. Um, chemical fertilization, the loss of organic matter in the soil, which I think is, is uh, true. Absolutely. Uh, it turns out, what do you know? I mean, uh, as John Muir once said, you know, uh, you pull one thing in nature and everything is hitched to it. Um, 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 all bad ideas seem to, <laughs> seem to seem to compound each other. And, and, and when they get to food, they get to the most important. I mean, look, there's a lot of questions that humans ask and answer um, every day, but the most important of those questions is, what's for dinner, and is there going to be any? I mean, that's the you know most bottom line question for human beings. And if you can't answer that question, then you can't have anything like a civilization. Yeah. yeah. I think Walter said he. I think it was something that came out of Arab. The, the Arab Spring and the, and the tremendous unrest is 72 hours is what is, separates us from essentially, you know, the disintegration of, of, of any society, 72 hours of food. If you don't have any, then, you know, after, after three days, things are going to get wild. Yeah. Yeah. Um, two more things. You said a really interesting thing about if Earth's history was put on a 24-hour time scale. Could you repeat that? And talking about what a little blip we are. Yeah, I can't that. quite remember the numbers. I think the 10,000 years of human history is like a fifth of a second or something. In the, <laughs> you know, so so it seems all-consuming to us, but it's uh, pretty short. And in that time, the stuff we've done is, uh, you know, I mean, in the last. 500 years, we've emerged as an absolutely geological force. I mean, you know, people will be able to, assuming we have uh, descendants, they'll be able to track our period in time for many, many millions of years by looking at the geological record. I mean, we have disrupted the world around us in incredibly profound ways and, and very, very sad ways. There was a study yesterday that showed that the number of wild animals on Earth has dropped 68% since 1970. You and I were alive in 1970. Yeah. The thought that there are 70% fewer wild animals on this planet than there were then is, is well, it should make us feel ashamed. Yeah, yeah. You've been uh, a tremendous voice in calling out to reverse that in, in trying to um, be a positive force on the planet instead of a negative one. Do you, have, do you have any words of encouragement for people about that as we go forward? I know, I know you have to tell a hard truth. Well, I, the, I mean, I think the, the thing to remind ourselves is, is we're in a, um, 
we're in one of those rare moments in human history when things really are on the line. It's not the first time, you know, our grandparents, parents, grandparents, you know, had to face down fascism in the middle of the last century. And to do it, they had to travel to Europe and either kill or get killed, you know. So that's harder than what we have to do. Um, but that doesn't, you know, we have to do big stuff and we have to do it fast. And and I, I, I think the only thing to just keep bearing in mind is the most important thing an individual can do, as I said, is be a little bit less of an individual. Find some other people in some established campaign or movement to work with so that your voice really will tell. Um, that's, at this point, the, the key thing, I think. And let me right. just thank you enormously for your work. And, and you know, uh, the organic movement was such a um, beacon and that there are people trying to keep it alive and uncorrupted uh, is powerful and important. So we're really grateful to you for it. Thank you, Bill McKibben. This has been uh, a real pleasure for me to talk with you. I also had a great time getting ready for the conversation, doing lots of reading. Uh, you have so much good stuff out there. Well, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope you'll subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a review on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you found us. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to today's conversation, can be found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 24. Please join us next time for an interview with biologist, author, speaker, and Baclay. To find a real organic farm near you, visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farms. <laughs>